Thanks everyone for uh, stopping by and checking out my talk. Uh, first introductions, so my name is Eric Guzman. I am a full stack engineer at Zeal, where I focus on doing Ruby on Rails and React.js predominantly. But after dark, I am a Microsoft MVP in developer tools. I do Alexa development. Uh, I'm a part-time technical content creator, and I also do uh, third-party uh, third-party tool app development for Twitch. And we'll get into that in a moment. So my talk is serverless to serving Elixir, uh, migrating serverless app to run on Phoenix. Uh, so I'm going to take you on this journey. It's first thing is just talking about uh, developing for Twitch, the platform, uh, going why I went serverless, the problems I faced going serverless, why Elixir, and then the migration process of going to Elixir. So first is developing for Twitch. So a quick introduction. So if no one knows what Twitch is, it's a live streaming platform. So think you know, just YouTube, live streaming. Um, the users are, are channels, which I'm going to reference for now on, that do the live streaming. Uh, just like with YouTube, where you go to a page to watch a video, you would go to a channel page to watch the person streaming. And viewership can dras vary drastically. It can be from one to 100,000, depending on the event or how popular the streamer is. And Twitch offers a, various, a, a plethora of different tools to allow for a channel to enhance the viewer experience, one of those being extensions. So uh, I'm going to dive more into extensions now. So what is a Twitch extension? So a Twitch extension is an HTML, CSS, JavaScript website. So it's just, it's just, a, web, it's just a web app living in an iframe. Uh, the, the app itself is hosted by, on the Twitch CDN. And it is managed kind of like an app store. So you have to submit the Twitch extension. They have to go through a review through process. It can take a week to two weeks for them to review it. You're in charge of the back end. So it hosts on the website, and then, you, and then you have to do, if you have any data, it goes to the back end. And then a Twitch channel is the one that installs it. So they go to a, like a, like a, kind of like an App Store page, and then they just like, oh, like, you know, just go install the extension. And then that extension is loaded by each individual user. So if there is only one viewer on their channel, one, one page load. If there's 100,000 viewers on a channel that just went live, that is 100,000 page loads in a matter of a, a minute. So it, it can vary drastically. So given, those, given what a Twitch extension is, how Twitch functions, uh, the recipe for success for building a Twitch extension is the, a number of things. So it's handling large bursts of traffic, like I mentioned just a moment ago. It needs to be scalable to handle like, a wide plethora of, you know, of requests. Uh, it needs to be fast because you know, everything needs to be fast and snappy. Um, it needs to be affordable because there's not really a, a monetization scheme on it. So it's pretty much you're kind of like offering like these kind of apps pro bono. And then it needs to be easy to deploy because who doesn't like, who doesn't like, you know, one button deployments. So, all right. So going serverless. So when Twitch extensions were first introduced, uh, Twitch came to, told all the developers, hey, try out serverless functions. And I was like, great, but oh, What's the serverless function? That was like five years ago. Uh, so let's just dive in quickly to serverless functions. Uh, so a serverless function is basically a fully managed infrastructure. So instead of you know instead of hosting your server and different M and, and writing up controls and stuff like that, you're just deploying individual little functions, little applications, little endpoints. Uh, it changes the whole pricing scheme. So instead of having to worry about hosting a server and paying for server costs. Instead, you're paying for invocations and duration. So you only pay for what's you're used. And, and usually the billing model is like, depending on the platform, you only start paying a couple cents after a million requests, after two million requests, just you have to pick your platform. They're easy to deploy. Um, 
depending on the integration, like there's CLI tools, sometimes you can just like, deploy from VS Code altogether, and, or you can do it from GitHub. Uh, they're affordable. Well, since you pay by invocation, and if my extension is not popular, and it only gets 100,000 views in a month, I don't pay anything, so awesome. And it's scalable, because since they're handling all the infrastructure, they're doing all the web hosting, I don't have to worry about scaling up servers and stuff like that, so if there's a large burst, if all of a sudden I have an adoption and there's 100,000 users doing requests all of a sudden, uh, I don't have to worry about it. It just happens, and I don't have to do anything. So uh, just to visualize that change, what the traditional hosting architecture is, is uh, the client, and then there's your server, and then in your server, you have your framework, you know, insert Rails, Phoenix, you know, whatever, Node. You have your database, your authentication. It's all living in the cloud. Well, serverless kind of breaks that all up. So now your client, now the logic is kind of in your client. Your client has to decide where the web requests go, and then each, all the, what those original actions were for, like, gets and destroys and updates are all individual little functions hosted on who knows whatever cloud that they're putting it on. And then now, because they're individual kind of units, uh, you got to worry about your database. So your database is a separate service. Your authentication is a separate service because now you're, not de now you're dealing with stateless stuff because each individual function is kind of separate on their own. So given what I learned about serverless after that recommendation, I'm like, OK, cool. It can handle large bursts of traffic. It's scalable. It's fast, from what I understood affordable, and it's easy to play. So great, it checks all those boxes of my requirements. So then I decided, okay, uh, what database am I gonna use now? So I didn't do too much investigation. I got introduced to Firestore, and I'm like, oh, okay, Firestore, well, I don't have to pay anything for a long-running database because I don't have to host Postgres, like I have to do with typical Ruby on Rails application. You just have to pay for reads and writes, so it's like, Oh, you only pay after 100 reads and like 200, 200 reads and like 100K after 100K writes. I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah, well, my extension's not going to do any good. I don't got to pay anything. Awesome. And then, uh, and, then, uh, and then also you just pay for network traffic. So like if you're sending lots of data back and forth, you have to pay for that too. But if, again, if I don't hit that threshold, all right. And then, uh, yeah, so again, I only have to pay if my extension's a success. I'm like, okay, cool. Well, that, for me being on a budget, awesome. Let's do that. So then I got to building. I built several applications going through that. And then, you know, and, you know I'm always thinking about something new because, you know, there's these always, we're always thinking about a new side project. So um, after building a number of applications, problems started to come up as time went on. Uh, one thing is cold starts on the initial call. call. Because, you're, because someone else is hosting and managing it and they're not paying, you're not paying for any server costs, uh, if no one calls that function after a while, it could take a while for it to load. So people, you know, everyone's always reading data. So it's like, like reading, the, the, reading the data, so that loads quick. But then when someone had to go to the settings page, that one is a whole separate function, and that could take a couple seconds to load. And that's not a pleasant experience. Luckily, you know, the, the tier for on a Twitch extensions and users is pretty low, so they're okay with it. But at scale, when you're dealing with more critical applications, it, it, it gets kind of uh, gets really annoying really fast, um, because doing you know serverless functions is really easy. I came up with the term called the microservice zoo, and this picture kind of does it justice. You just kind of like start deploying things. You're like, cool, function here, function there. Oh, I can just spin up a new app, new app there, new app there. So each one of those applications ended up being a new app. A, new, a whole new project. Instead of thinking about consolidating and, you know, and you know, you know, better architecture that we typically do on the job. So it ends up becoming kind of hard to manage. Uh, and, and, and because we're kind of, you know, I'm throwing applications here and there, you kind of end up with duplicated logic across different functions or across different projects. And then you start getting ideas, ooh, maybe I should make an NPM package for that if you're ready to know JS, which ends up being not, you know, it, when you're a solo developer or dealing with a small team, it's not, it's not scalable to like have to manage different things and have to start thinking about libraries in order to consolidate logic. And then also, if you, if you do come across success, you have to start paying money. And the thing is, is depending on the type of application you're building, costs can be completely variable. One, one month, you're paying nothing. The next month, you know, uh, like the next hottest streamer picks up my extension, and boom, I have to start paying. Uh, and so it's like I can't 
reliably budget on stuff like you have to do with the typical server environment where you just know your monthly cost right away. And then also, um, you know, you have to kind of be lean and efficient with everything you do because you're paying by invocation. So at the same time that I, you know, people started installing it, bad code started, <laughs> bad design decisions started. So like, for example, I was doing polling and doing any sort of polling is not good because since you're paying by invocation and data transfer, you can't do polling. So you have to aggressively cache or you basically have, you just have to pull all the data all at once and just hold on to it. So, yeah. And then going on to Firestore, uh, so Firestore is, or any NoSQL database, it's, it's because there's no structured data to it um, and you're trying to iterate fast, you can make the mistake of making bad schema decisions. So it's like you're, you could be inclined to just like throw data in there <laughs> and like because it works. But later on down the line when you're trying to extend features, you're like, oops, I kind of, I, sh I, sh I didn't have the foresight. Maybe I should have put this in another document store, did some references. So you can, make, you can easily make bad schema decisions, especially when you're trying to move fast. Um, you can suffer from vendor locking. It's not easy to export your data out of these like different NoSQL vendors. Because there's no standardization, these are all like their own unique technologies. They all have their special export format. So like for Firestore, I'm like, okay, I wanna learn how to export it. And it's like, oh, you can export it out into BigQuery, the whole other service. I'm like, that's not helpful. I wanna just export it out into JSON, not a thing. And then uh, because, and then, yeah, and then because if you have constant read and writes, you have to start, you pay extra money too. So those bad, the bad, the, those bad API decisions that I had for, let's say, polling ended up compounding because I had more reads and writes to, more reads to the database. So costs went up. So bad, bad data design decisions just compound on top of each other. So then, so with all those bad things, um, What's the reason I just decided to go with Elixir? So let's just go on a little side story here. So one of the other extensions that was on that slide uh, was Stringco's Captioner. So this, so Stringco's Captioner is a Twitch extension. Is a Twitch extension that a channel can install and add closed captions to the stream because Twitch streamers they can't add native closed captioning. It was built on Ruby on Rails. Aggressively uses WebSockets to send captions from the client to the server, and then broadcast that out using your Twitch API to all the, all the clients. So it would broadcast out to all, you know, 40,000 users that are across all the channels that are using the extension. And you can kind of see like right there, it's over the video for them to see it. And this was the original architecture. Ruby on Rails, Redis for WebSockets, Postgres, I guess Postgres is awesome. And then, and then a dep hard dependency on the Twitch API to send those messages that were going from the server to all the Twitch channels because they had a PubSub API for me to use. But like most Ruby on Rails stories, uh, with success came problems. And I started, because I was using WebSockets, I learned after a while that WebSockets aren't efficient on Ruby on Rails. Very inefficient, in fact. <laughs> and I started receiving out of memory errors, timeouts, uh, too many, and because I'm paying for this myself, trying to go as small as possible on an AWS instance uh, it doesn't, it does not help active record performance <laughs> and lots of requests that are happening every, uh, every second and, and active record queries. And then it gets expensive to scale. I mean, like I had to just scale the instance up just to compile the app during, during deployments because I was using Elastic Beanstalk and that's, that, that's so annoying, like I'm, try, I'm trying to save money here. I can't, I can't just up the instance just to, just to deploy the application. And then also I had to babysit the server uh, because like every once in a while I would just have to restart the app because I need to flush the cache and flush all the memory that's like building up because it, everything's just being super inefficient. So something had to give. And that's where uh, I got introduced to Elixir. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna rebuild, I'm just gonna rewrite this whole app in Elixir from scratch. Took me about three months to do it from completely. And after doing that, I was able to immediately remove Redis. Cool, saving money there. I still kept the same Postgres, 
you know, Elixir, obviously. And then I discovered that Elixir was so e efficient with WebSockets that I was actually able to eliminate the Twitch API altogether and just have all the clients, all 40,000 viewers or more, directly connect through Elixir subscriptions or uh, GraphQL subscriptions to receive WebSocket messages. So I was able to eliminate a whole API dependency altogether. So that was really awesome. And it just became a deploy and forget it scenario. So removing Redis, WebSockets are amazing, super memory efficient. It was affordable to host because it was memory efficient, a lot smaller instance sizes. I'm hosting it on Gig Elixir. And then I love the fact that it was, it's fail, like, I call it fail fast and recover fast. I dreaded when I had to restart my Rails server because when I restarted my Rails server, all the clients are going to re do requests to connect. And then it would take minutes for my Rails server to catch up to all those requests. Whereas Elixir, it's like restart, everyone does a request, everyone gets a response, and boom, nothing. And so, like, so these are just like a bunch of stats. Like, I mean, t 20 millisecond response times versus like 100 millisecond on Rails. Shh, come on. It was so easy. So yeah, so Elixir hit all the marks for requirements for my serverless stuff. So like, it handles our traffic, it's scalable, it's fast, it's affordable, and it's easy to deploy with tools like Giga Elixir, Fly.io. So I was like, let's go for it. All right, so the great migration. Let me introduce you to the application that I was gonna first start migrating. So the first application I was working on was a stream team extension. So this extension just allows a channel to create, manage, display their Twitch team. So they come in, they can, uh, they, they, can choose, they can choose a team, whether they're part, there's teams that are specific to Twitch, or they can create a, bus, a custom team, which is this view has right here, where you can build out and add channels, and, and then in the panel, they would display them. So in that panel is what's installed on their channel, so the viewer would see that panel, and then they can see all the people on their team, and then click on it and visit the, their fellow teammates' channels. And so yeah. So that's the, that's the target goal. So these, these, were my, these were my priorities for doing the migration. Uh, I want to get out of, first I want to get out of Firestore, get over to Postgres again. Uh, I don't want any downtime, uh, even, though, even though this is my own application, I'm kind of like, I'm a stickler for stuff, so like, I, I want zero downtime. And then also, I don't want any data loss during that transition period. So like when, when, I'm, switching, or when I'm switching from serverless to Phoenix, I don't want to lose any data in the process of doing that. So. This was the roadmap I devised. First, proxy. I'm going to set up my schema, design my database, repli replicate the logic, and tap into that data, uh, and then export the data to post Postgres, and then switch to, uh, to GraphQL altogether. So creating the API proxy. So this is the current flow for the Twitch extension. So it does a request. It can either do the a request to the get, fu to the get function or to the upsert function, it does some internal JWT token authentication, it hits Firebase, it goes to Twitch for authentication because they need to validate whether they're on the, whether they're on the Twitch team, a couple of their business logic-y stuff. So then, that's, so then this is the sequence diagram, because why not, uh, that I want to do it. So that, that line right there is where I want to put the proxy right in. So how am I, so next thing is like, how am I going to set up this proxy? And I discovered a, a, a library tool called Terraform. So Terraform's main objective is to do API migrations. It makes, you, it, makes it really easy to just set up a controller, set up a couple endpoints that you want to handle, and then you just put your business logic in. So you don't have to worry about doing like a whole bunch of like scaffolding and stuff like that. It's basically, you install it, you configure the file, you set up, the, you set up your routes, and then you put your business logic in there, and then you can decide what to do from there. Cool. Now I know what I'm going to do. So I'm just going to slip Phoenix right in between. So now my flow looks like this. So now I have Twitch extension, Phoenix, and serverless. And all right, we're doing right now is just doing a pure proxy. So the obligated horrible code to show. So all I'm doing with this function right here is just le at legacy stream teams, get display info. And all I'm doing is getting the request. So I rewrote the Twitch extension, released it does a request to this. All I'm doing is unwrapping the JWT token, sending that over to my Azure function, and then taking that response and passing it back. Nothing else. Little comment of what's to come right there. <laughs> so uh, getting to the why of things.
So why did I do this? So being able to update your, so the main reason is being able, I wanted to deploy this first, just this, just the proxy, because I wanted to be able to update my server configuration um, at any time without having to worry about releasing another Twitch extension, because it's gonna take a week to two weeks to release my, fr my front end. I'm not in control of my front end, someone else is. I have to wait for one to two week release cycles. It's almost like an app store for an app. And then, yeah, so then because of that, I can easily then deploy and start testing out my business logic, all my configurations and stuff like that. So first is just get the proxy in there, worry about the business logic second uh, as, the, as the second phase. So yeah, so now comes the business logic phase, creating the schema. So this was the original schema for the, for the uh, extension. It was two documents, just uh, the channel record, which is you know, just the channel itself, some li little bit of data and then the custom team that had some information on there. And then I talked about bad schema design and this, this section right here of just storing an array of user IDs for the, uh, for the Twitch channels ended up being a bad schema idea because people wanted to, people, members of the team wanted to be able to also use the team and I was like, oh God, this is not, this is not a good design decision. So with, with that so with that foresight and after using it, this is how I converted everything. I went from basically two tables to four, so I went from, I, I have a Twitch channel, a Twitch channel has a Twitch cha has a channel team, a channel team could possibly have a custom team because there's two different types of teams in my extension, and then a custom team has its members, and then those members me reference back to a Twitch channel. And then just so, just so some codes, just to show like I spread this across two contexts, one context being the Twitch channel, and then the other, con and then the other, the other three, uh, the other three ecto schemas are part of the stream team domain. So, why did I go through these steps? So I wanted to separate the team entity from the channel entity because what I wanted to do was I wanted to associate other my other extensions to a Twitch channel, so they're not coup tightly coupled. So I have my Twitch channel, and then I can have other app entities in there. And then I also wanted to do it so that I could have, if another user that was added to a team, a custom team, came in and installed the extension, they could see other cu the custom teams they were added to. So they don't have to recreate the same custom team that their friend just did. They can easily do it. So now that I have all these beautiful associations in the Postgres, I can easily do all those queries for it. And that's what, the, that's what I set up for. All those belongs to has many, all type of stuff. So the great migration, replicating the logic and tapping into the data. So again, this is what the flow currently look. So this is what the this is what the flow looks like now. So I have, I have the Twitch extension. The Twitch extension is going doing a request to Phoenix, and then Phoenix from there is doing those par parsing out those requests to upsert or get or Firebase. What I want to do now is I want to take the business logic that's happening and all those functions, and I just want to move them over into Phoenix now. So this is what the new flow looks like. So I have, since I've already set up my database schema, now I can now replicate the JDB2 auth stuff. I can, st I can, from Phoenix, I can do the same type of validation that the upsert is doing over to Twitch. And then I can also start pushing data into Postgres. And then this is a little update to the, to the code. So now I'm just doing a little bit of authentication now. I'm doing some validation. And then I'm also, and then I'm also saving to Postgres. The same data that I'm still pushing over to the serverless function, I'm saving over to Postgres. So why did I, do, why did I go through this step of the process? So one thing was it allowed me to test my schema. Because like, there, you can, like most things, like most things during our development experience, stuff you mock up and test doesn't happen in production. So I wanted to test it with the real world data coming in, so I can go into the database and validate everything's working good. If the, the you know because because I was dealing with a NoSQL database and no structure to it, I could have like messed, I could have added some additional document keys on accident like early early on in development. So I was able to test things. I also, this also benefited to testing server performance. So I was able to see like, oh, do I, the, server, the current configurations that I have on fly.io, are they gonna be able to support all of the requests that are coming in from my Twitch extensions, from the Twitch extension installations? And yeah, cool. 
And then the other thing is, is I can, I'm able to save uh, data in flight. So while data is going to the touch to the serverless functions, scan store and Firebase, I'm also starting to save those into Postgres. And this is going to enable for data export in the future. And I'll get to that in a moment, in a little bit. And by a little bit, I mean right now. <laughs> so exporting data into uh, to Firebase. So like I mentioned before, uh, you can't just export data out of Firebase because they're like, hey, here's my proprietary for syntax to do it. So uh, I was really frustrated until I found, until I probably saw, I, I saw this blog post somewhere about Superbase released a really cool library called Firebase to Superbase. And uh, what Firebase to Superbase does is it is it, it just a couple commands that you have to run that will pull down everything from your document, convert it to JSON files, and then the, those JSON files will then get pushed over to Superbase for, for their storage. And Superbase is a Postgres backed database. So if, if you're gonna go with any service, I would actually suggest Superbase. But what I really needed, what, I already had a Postgres database, so all I needed was that JSON phase of it. So now that I had, now that I ran the command and had the JSON file, I needed to get it into Postgres. So how was I gonna do that? So now, so I was able to actually use LiveView. So now like the obligatory reference to LiveView in, at the Elixir Conf. So LiveView actually has like a really awesome, just like kind of like built-in kind of uploader. Like there, there's, a, there's, a do, there's some documentation for it. So I just copied and pasted that. It was like upload feature already there. It was simple to do, to upload any file you want. Uh, yeah, easy to set up. And then I just, and then I used, uh, I just threw in some, I threw in Oban to handle background processing because I'm dealing with 20,000, 40,000 records and I can't do that synchronously. So I threw an Oban into there. And if you're curious about how to do uploads, I threw a screenshot in here of LiveView in the section. I basically just copied and pasted this whole thing and then I just, and then I just, <laughs> and then I scaffolded some Oban process and then I just, and then that's where I did all my upserts to the database. So, so why did I go through this process first? Well, the main thing is to get away from vendor lock-in. Get, get away from, from Firebase, um, DynamoDB, whatever, whatever other like, serverless type of, of a database you want to use, get away from that. I wanted to start having stable, consistent costs because depending on the time of the month, depending on who installs it, I can have, I can be paying like $5, $10, $20. But at least with Postgres, I know I'm going to be paying like $20, $10, $20 every single month, depending on the size of my instance. And then the thing I did, the thing that I was, the thing I was confident about, about doing this uploading phase is I knew I wasn't going to be experiencing any, any data loss during, during this phase. And why is that? It's because at the time, because I'm already inserting data into the data, into the Postgres database. So when I exported out my data from Firestore, that's a snapshot in time. So any upsert, any data that's being saved to the NoSQL database is data I'm missing. But since I'm already inserting into Postgres, I can just ease, I can reliably, when I start importing that data from the exported file, all I do is I just do a diff on where it's, which is the newest record coming in. Like just do the newest record. It's like, oh wait, I already have this record in Postgres. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna override it. So I knew, so I had no data loss whatsoever during that phase. So yeah, and then finally, it was the, uh, how am I on time? <laughs> okay, great. And then it was a switch to, 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 and then finally a switch to NoSQL. So at this point, in, cer in terms of the, uh, in terms of the layout, I could basically could have just nixed, you know, the proxy calls, but where's the fun in that? Um, because when I zoom in on here, Really, you know, my, my Twitch extension is still kind of doing a little bit of the same thing. You know, I'm, I'm having multiple lines come in. I'm doing, I have to do a URL for my post request. I have to do a URL for my destroy and all those other lines. And that's not cool. You know, what's cooler is being able to do one single endpoint, which is GraphQL. So I wanted to do that. And I mean, because, I mean, look at that. Like one, you know, if I want to fetch information, that's my GraphQL schema for fetching information. There's my channel. If I want to grab the channel stream team, I can grab that information. I can grab their custom team, and then I can grab their team members. 
And I, I don't know. I just, I just like that. I think, I think that's really beautiful. <laughs> so why did I do it? I, basically, it's graphy was cool, and I just felt like it. I didn't really need to do that part, but I just wanted to do it because I thought it would be fun. And it allowed me to um, get back to this, where I'm, this, this part where when I finally did that update to the Twitch extension and switched over to GraphQL, I was able to do one release out once it was approved and release that, and then I knew I was fully switched over to all internal, all hosted by Phoenix, all serving up all that data, and I can just could have, and then I can just completely nix all that proxy code, all that type of stuff, and I'm fully baked into that. So it was like it was like a direct cutover of everything. So it was really great. So yeah. So just to recap, why did I do all this work? So the first main thing was uh, get away from vendor lock-in, both from NoSQL and from serverless functions, because you kind of beholden to what they're what they're doing, what their schema is, and like and and how you have to design everything. I wanted consistent costs. Now that like my extensions work, you know, we're seeing some success. I don't instead of having instead of looking at every month's billing cycle and seeing like oh, I'm paying twenty dollars, oh I'm only paying five dollars a month. I know exactly how much I'm going to be paying. It's extremely performant. I mean, the main selling part for serverless was that, you know, like, oh, it's like, it's, it's really fast, it's really scalable. Well, Elixir's freaking fast and scalable too, so why not go with that? And then very low cost. It actually, what I was paying for on serverless, I actually, all the same traffic is free, is, runs on the free tier of fly.io, which blew my mind. <laughs> so I actually, don't, I actually don't have to pay anything because it just runs on the free tier, coincidentally. And then relation, relational databases are great. I think most people, most people will say this, it's like, oh, should I go NoSQL? And they're like, no, because relational database can do everything you want. <laughs> if you want JSON, just make a column for it, you know? But you probably don't. <laughs> and then it's just easy, and then Elixir's just easy to manage. With like the, like the tooling with gig Elixir, fly.io, um, you just don't have to do that much configuration, and it's just so easy to deploy. And, and I don't have to worry about app restarts or memory runtime issues. It's just so easy. You just set it and forget it. So that's all I got. So thanks.